from EPAWA Weather Consulting, headquartered in Worth Whitehall, Pennsylvania. This is Weather Weeklies, an informative video of the ins and outs of weather that affect you most in the EPAWA coverage area. The thoughts and opinions expressed in this video are those of the forecaster alone and may not reflect those of the staff of EPAWA Weather Consulting LLC as a whole, nor its constituents. Now, without further ado, here is meteorologist Bobby Martrich with Weather Weeklies. And good Sunday morning to you. Uh, sorry for the delay. I had a lot of things going on this morning to set this uh, video up and get everything back into normal routine. This is the first Weather Weeklies videos of the 2022-2023 winter season. And if, for those of you that don't know what this is, we do a uh, recap of the Long Range Outlook over the next five, six weeks in video format. And uh, take a look at any storm signals that we may have on the horizon. That is what typically we do, okay? And, we, and I don't do seasonal outlooks. Uh, seasonal outlooks, in my opinion, are a waste of time and resources. And nobody can really grasp what's going to happen. Uh, you know, if I'm sitting here in November, what's going to happen in, in uh, late January, March, uh, February? It's just, it's just not going to be... You can guess. I can guess. You can guess. Anybody can guess. Uh, that's all it is to me, and it's a waste of time. So if you're seeing those winter outlooks out there, um, you know, make sure you just, you, know, you can read it for entertainment purposes. I tell people to just uh, crumble them up, throw them in the garbage after you're done. Uh, use them for target practice, maybe in a dartboard. I don't know, whatever. It, it's, they're not really um, uh, worth the time and effort, okay? You have a 50-50 shot of it getting right or wrong, no matter how much research is put into them. I don't care who it is that's doing it. It's just not... Uh, feasible to go beyond our comfortable long range lead time of five to six weeks. Five to six weeks is it. Okay, so this is our long range outlook here on uh, Friday that we did. This is the chart from that long range outlook. And uh, so again, this stops at about six weeks. This goes up to December 18th here as far as temperatures go. And, uh, you know, obviously we have that very warm period right now. That's not going to last. I think we're going to have some cooler temperatures coming in here. Uh, next weekend, okay? So we're going to have still milder uh, periods this week. We are going to cool down Tuesday and Wednesday temporarily, and then we go back into slightly above average uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday this week. Not quite as warm as we, we were, are right now, but it will be uh, still above average at that point. And then I think you get this colder period coming here, starting the 13th and going at least through the 19th. This might go, actually go a couple of days longer than this or maybe go from slightly below average to near to slightly below average. Whatever, uh, but you might not know much of a difference here for the remainder of uh, November once this moves through, okay? Uh, so you can see the big thing here is I give an average snowfall uh, for the next two months. There's really not a lot here in November, not a lot across most of our climate stations, except for the far northern and interior locations that will have uh, the opportunity for some measurable snowfall in November. It has happened before. It's not something that happens often. And it's usually a minor deal if it happens. This is averaging over the last 30 years of November snowfall. So this is where you get these numbers from. Also, you see December snowfall goes up quite a bit higher, uh, typically. But again, this there's been years, I will tell you, uh, and you guys all know this very well, over the past decade or so, uh, you know, December snowfall has been uh, more of a commodity because it really hasn't been starting until middle to late January and... Uh, and I've been dealing with it every single year on most of those years where people were like, okay, uh, well, we keep kicking the can down the road here. When's winter starting? I thought winter was supposed to start by now. Well, uh, I don't think you'll have to worry about that this year. In fact, I think it's going to start before winter begins on December 21st, and we're going to have snow in late autumn, um, especially once we get into early to mid-December, I think is your best chance around here. And we'll get into that here in this video. Obviously, year-to-date snowfall is zero across the region. Nobody has any measurable precipitation. This is what it is year-to-date, not expecting to be much higher than zero. This actually starts, uh, you know, from any snowfall you would receive from July 1st onwards. So this would include, uh, you know, October as well. But uh, obviously no snowfall so far. But that does change here once we get into uh, December, we think. So here is the, uh, taking a look at near term first. And again, I want to look at uh, just these this temperature changing this week. We have the very warm temperatures surge at the end of this week that's going to change 
on Saturday as that cold front moves through. And then you get this cold surge where you have some really chilly temperatures relative average. And this goes all the way to the 19th here, and you still have slightly below average temperatures here. Uh, I can tell you it's probably going to go a little bit further than that. Our, our long range on Friday indicated to the 19th. I think it might go maybe a little longer than that with the slightly below stuff, or at least near to slightly below average for a while. But you're not going to see much of a difference because looking at what average is, you have to remember, uh, average highs are going down by about three degrees per week every single week from here to the middle of uh, December, and then they start slowing down a little bit. So if you're looking at uh, average temperatures right now uh, that are generally 55 to 60 or there about, you know, two weeks from now when this is showing these slightly below average temperatures around the 19th, well, that's two weeks from now. So two weeks is going to be six degrees average temperatures lower than they are now. And then you're going to be slow, uh, slightly below average that. So you have to remember it's, this is slightly below average uh, when these uh, temperatures come in here relative to the day or to the time of year, okay? So these continue to go down, and at the same time, you know, temperature, so you see what I mean here. That, that's what's going on. So taking a look at this at uh, Lehigh Valley International Airport, which is our centermost region of our coverage area. I'm just going to use this as an example. A little bit warmer further southeast, uh, south and east of there, and a little cooler slightly uh, further north of there. But you get the general idea of temperature trends with this graph here. Uh, this particular location, the current average high uh, for November 6th is 58 degrees. Two weeks from now, six degrees less at 52. That is what average is for high temperatures. And you can see these warm temperatures here. Then Tuesday, Wednesday, you get slightly, you know, near to slightly below average temperatures for a couple days. And then you get that surge for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? And ahead of that cold front, once the cold front comes through, look at this. You're about either side of, of 45 degrees for an extended period. And this goes all the way from the 13th to the 20th, in fact. So uh, you're going to go a little bit further than that, I think. And, you know, in, you, the anomalies might come up a little bit where it's not quite as anomalously cool in the late month period. But at the same time, temp average temperatures are going down. So they're going to kind of meet. And you might not see much of a difference here when you get in the late month period, uh, even if those anomalies are not quite as anomalously cool as they were before because the average temperature is coming down. So you might, might not see much of a difference there. Okay. Um, so I do want to talk about the Manitoulin Oscillation a little bit because the uh, this is a climate driver uh, determining the best areas of best convection across the Pacific. And all these phases numbers here, oops, I didn't mean to do that. All the phase numbers on here mean something. Uh, the phase numbers all represent a certain portion of the equatorial uh, regions where the convection is, the best convection that will affect the jet stream with heat, latent heat release processes will affect the jet stream and the jet stream configurations downstream. So depending on where these are, again, all these numbers mean something. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? They all mean something. Different portions of the uh, placement of that best convection. You Ideally in winter, you want it out here, seven, eight, one, right? Because then you get, uh, in that case, you have latent heat release sent poleward and you can get ridging and that's the, that's the idea, right? That's the idea with uh, the, you know, the further west this is, let's say it's in phase four and it's pumping up the, the uh, jet here. Well, it goes up, must come down and uh, well, nope, that won't work, right? See what I mean? So it's kind of helping your, that's not as simple as that, but I'm just giving you an idea of, of generally speaking to it to a public audience here that has no clue what the amount of Julian oscillation is, just giving you a broad overview. So uh, this is a projection going forward through the early part of December from where we are now, and it takes it through phase eight. Uh, into the circle of death, which is the circle, uh, the circle in the middle here. And it takes it back through phase six, phase seven, and then loops it right here. Okay, this is what the GFS extended has going through early des, uh, December. The European weeklies does something very similar. Doesn't take it quite as, as, as amplified as the GEFS ensemble or GFS extended, but it has the same general idea where they both end up in phase seven and it sticks in there for a little bit. Well, when we get into phase seven during the month of uh, December, this is what you're dealing with, okay? Uh, this in a in a negative, or which is a La Nina, in a La Nina in the month of December, phase seven typically produces this for a 500 millibar height anomaly, which will give you cooler temperatures across the Middle Atlantic Northeast or Great Lakes region, right? And just to our southeast, you have some warm temperatures across the southeastern United States. Well, this is what the uh, temperature anomaly is on the Euro weeklies in week two of December. We see now this is a, the Euro weeklies typically have a 
Uh, it's a smooth down perturbed mean. The longer you go out, the less effective it is. But it's showing slightly below average temperatures here, which are probably a little bit colder than what, even what's indicated here because as you're going out pretty far with 50 individual members and you're showing slightly below average temperatures here to start the month of December. Here is the uh, GFS Ensemble doing the same thing. This is going to loop from the 1st through the 10th of December, but you see it's doing the same thing. See that? It's going to loop here, and you still got slightly below average temperatures here, and it starts to increase by time to get to the, like that same look that you see in December on the Euro Weekly. So they're both in agreement, which is a very good thing. I do think, again, that December starts off cooler than average, and that we're going to start off with the snow a little bit faster than we have uh, in previous years. So let's take a look at the climate drivers now. This is probably the extent I'll go into long-range stuff, like very long-range stuff, okay, because I just want to, given this is the first video of the season, which we do every single Sunday, uh, you know, uh, it, it's something I want to just, just touch on here a little bit, and we'll expand upon it in future videos each and every week. But here is your uh, cold waters in the equatorial Pacific that make up the La Nina. It is weighted over here in, in uh, areas uh, 1 and 2, in, or Nino 1 and 2 areas, which is near the Peruvian coast. So it's a little colder there near the Peruvian coast than anywhere else within this whole area. But I would consider this a basin-wide event, uh, just leaning east, east-based. Uh, I don't think it's going to last forever, though. I don't think La Nina is going to last forever. We are now in a third consecutive La Nina. So we've had a La Nina two years ago. We had a La Nina last year. And now we're having a third, okay? And this only happened twice before that we have for as far as a data set to rely on and to see what as far as analogs go, like last year we were using these, a lot of these videos I was using an analog from 2018, and it kind of served us well for a while there through much of the winter last year. This year I really can't do an analog because we don't have enough of data set. We just don't. Uh, well, this is a third year La Nina, which is not unprecedented, but we don't have enough of a sample size going back in time to say, well, and it's never an if A then B type situation, but you know, we can, at least we can get an idea of like, well, these favor snowier years, these favor warmer years, these favor wetter years. We, can, we can't do any of that, okay? In the near term, we can, however, and I'll show you that in a little bit. So here is uh, the area where it's the coldest across the uh, Central Pacific or across the, um, across the Pacific, equatorial Pacific regions. You can also see a warm pool up in this area in the North Pacific. This has not been here over the last couple of years, or at least not to this extent. So I think this is going to play a big role in the Eastern Pacific Oscillation uh, during this winter, and we'll get to that in a second too. Also very warm along the East Coast and just south of Greenland. This whole area here is very warm. So, uh, you know, that could uh, energize some East Coast storms if ones would form down the road. But I think uh, other than that, uh, that's really our biggest stories here from a uh, why it's a La Nina. This area here is in blue instead of yellows and reds and that means we are in a la nina for the third straight year here's what we are uh again most areas along the in that area are minus one degree celsius uh you know below average so uh minus 1.8 near the peruvian coast so that is your coldest region so this is generally a slightly below average or a slightly uh, weak la nina basically for most areas and then it's going to be a moderate near the coast of the peruvian peruvian coast there in in uh, nino one and two now I do think this is not going to last for, for, for much longer, though. I think it's going to start off this winter as a La Nina, and then it will end as a uh, in Enso neutral, okay, in the neutral state. If you look at uh, the dynamic, now this, is, I, this is from October. We don't have an update in November yet. This red line here in the middle uh, shows you where we are right now, and it kind of goes like this. This is your red line I'm talking about. Just follow that along right there. That's where the uh, red line is. Uh, if you look at... Uh, to the left here. This is all obviously in weak La Nina state. Once you get below 1.5, you are in moderate La Nina. So we're not that quite. We're right around a weak La Nina. Once you get in between here and here, oops, that is a Enso neutral. If you see this, um, the uh, statistical mean here crosses into and rises from a La Nina into Enso neutral projected right around January. That is right around January right here when that is expected to happen. Okay, so I think you're going to start weakening a little bit here in the month of December. Not yet. I think we're still staying where we are now, but we're going to weaken with the La Nina in January, or excuse me, December, and then January might just go away entirely and we end up in an Enso neutral. So with that being said, uh, these outlooks that are calling for the, you know, the third straight La Nina, blah, 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 that's going to hold serve for the next two months, for November, December. I don't know if that holds 
weight as much in January, February, March. So if you're doing a winter outlook based on a climate background state, that's not even going to be correct. You know, uh, that you're going to have your have the an incorrect outlook for areas January, February, March, or at least the latter part of January through the month of March. Because, uh, you know, it's a lot different story here when you get an Enso Nutra winter. Here's what a paintbrush La Nina looks like. Paintbrush, meaning typical okay it is never exactly like this but this is generally what a la nina does okay we've seen this this see this is another third straight year i'm showing this of what a uh, because we had a third consecutive la nina colder air is up here in the northern plains all the way back to alaska right and you got warmer temperatures and drier weather out here like this okay and your cold is up here see that now uh noah put out their one outlook a few weeks ago and this is was shared by many media sources, TV sources, whatever. Uh, it well, it was, and none of them picked up on this. Uh, but here is what NOAA's winter outlook looks like. Okay, temperatures and precipitation. Interesting. This looks like this verbatim. There's no variation. Like they just caught. They, they, this tells me that NOAA just went. I don't know what's going to happen this winter. So we're just going to copy and paste what a typical paint, paintbrush La Nina is. You know, I'm sure they didn't do that. They did some research. But it looks this way. This is exactly, well, here's the temperatures. Warm here and cool here. Yep, warm here, cool here. And then precipitation, wet upper north, um, in the Pacific Northwest and the Great Lakes. And across the deep south, it is drier than average. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's literally copy and paste. It is. And you can't make this stuff up. But people are publishing these articles saying, oh, well, Noah thinks you're getting, Noah doesn't think anything. They don't. They don't think. They don't think about any of this. They just went, well, we don't know what's going to happen to third year La Nina. So we're just going to put out what a typical La Nina does. And there's a lot of sources that do this. And there's ones that are more aggressive with snow. And those are the snow bunnies, the ones that want it to happen. Wanting it to snow does not make it snow. That's not how it works. But, you know, it is what it is. Okay, so these winter outlooks just... Anyway, uh, so this is what an Enso neutral winter does. We showed what, they do, what, what you know, a paintbrush La Nina is. This is a neutral. If we do go into a neutral here late in the winter, this is typically, again, typically what it will what it'll yield. Uh, upper Midwest Great Lakes, Northeast Mid-Atlantic are colder than average. And then you have an increased subtropical jet across the southern United States. You can get this going. Uh, some of our bigger storms happen in a, in a neutral. So, you know, I'm not saying, listen, I'm not trying to project downstream. I'm just telling you that if we do get into this Enso neutral phase and there's some other factors in play, we could certainly benefit from that as far as uh, snowfall, if you love snowfall anyway. So let's look at the La Nina years. Again, we I said mentioned we only had, this is, a, this is a third consecutive La Nina. It's only the second time we have a data set for. And those are right here. Uh, we have... 7374 is the first one, 7475 is the second. Here is the third in that series of third consecutive year La Nina, 7576. The second one is 9899, 99, 2000, and 2000, 2001 is the other. Again, this is the third in a series of three consecutive La Ninas. So we have two here, right here, 1975 and 1976. That's all we have for a data set. That's it. Okay. So what I did. Is took out early season snowfall by location in a third consecutive La Nina winter. This is looking at our major climate stations across the region and see if we can make a correlation between these two years. Well, if you look at the winter as a whole, 1975, 19, 1976 wasn't that great. I mean, it wasn't horrible. It was more like last year, kind of like last year was, right, in terms of snowfall, if you, except for Atlantic City because that was, they could certainly more than that. But you look at 2000 and 2001, which is the other one, and had a, you know, more than a above average snowfall winter, just, just about everywhere. Okay. So this was more beneficial than normal. Now I don't have Wilkesbury in the 2000, 2001, for whatever reason, they didn't have a, they don't have anything. Uh, they didn't have an observer in those years to actual, an official observer. Uh, but uh, given by the, you know, triangulation of these points here and how much snowfall this year, I'm sure they were above average that year as well. So 2000, 2001 is the, uh, Second one, but here's the important thing I want to take it. I want you to take notice of in this chart, right? November 1975. I'm going to circle November 1975 right here, and November 2000. What do you see that is similar about those two years? Looks like we didn't have much snow, right? Not in the month of November. The areas, the exceptions are 
Wilkesbury, well, it doesn't have anything in 2000, there was no observer, but Wilkesbury, right? Uh, Williamsport, interior areas. The rest of the areas are trace or nothing, okay? So that's the correlation you can make between those two from an early, you can use this early on because again, you stick at the five to six week lead time like we do in long range, you can be a lot more accurate than you are when trying to say January, February, March, right? So here in December, same thing. Here's December 1975. Uh, we have some snow here. And then December 2000, you have a lot, lot of snow for the month of December compared to what you should have. About double what you normally get in the month of December. Now, again, you're probably going to look at this at face value and say, oh, well, these aren't these aren't, aren't uh, near each other either. No, they're not. But there's a common theme here. The common theme is you're getting snow in this month at every location, even Atlantic City. Even Atlantic City. Uh, again, no observer in Harrisburg in 1975-1976 either. So we don't have any information for there. But here's the same. It's the same thing. You're getting measurable accumulating snowfall across the region here in December. It might not be a ton, but you're getting it. And the same thing, we're not waiting until January to get accumulating snowfall. That's the point, okay? And then you get to December. Here it was a lot more, okay, in December. Now, it could end up being this. could end up being... In between here somewhere, it could be more than this. Who knows? But uh, the whole idea here is that I think it's starting in December. You're not waiting, okay? And there's several reasons, several reasons that they go into that. It's not just the models. Uh, you got the atmospheric angular momentum is positive right now. I mean, there's there's things like East, East Asian mountain torque and the Siberian high that's going to play a role. The Scandinavian ridge are going to play a role. Blocking is going to play a role. The EPO is going to play a big role, I think, this year. This is going to be something that I think is going to be a huge player because if you looked at the sea surface temperatures thing I showed you that before, and that big warm pool that's up here in the Gulf of Alaska, and, and where it's more expansive than it was last year, you can get ridging into that area as a result of that. And uh, you know, ridging into Alaska means downstream cold uh, in the eastern United States in favor of a positive PNA. So we'll see. Uh, Eastern Pacific Oscillation is predominantly expected to be negative here on the Euro, uh, the Euro Weeklies going forward. Now the, um, you know, it has predominantly negative on the control run and everything. Most of these uh, individual members are below also uh, as we go forward with the EPO. So that would, this would mean that you're going to have cold filtering into, once you get the cold, that's the first part of the cold is to get snow. You need that, that is the first ingredient. We get the cold in here, um, you know, then that's the, that's the first step. Okay. Moisture would be the second step. So I think going forward, since we have that opportunity to be predominantly negative Eastern Pacific oscillation, we'll have some cold air available to tap into at least early on. So what about storm signals? Now it's a little bit too late or early to list any storm signals in the long range outlook. I don't get those quite yet. I think I'm leaning toward the second week of December as our first time. You could have some BS before this, right? some minor snow so let me stop let me go up to where the, where the second week of december starts that's right here okay so anything before this so look at these amounts they're like you know trace amounts or whatever at most this is at lehigh valley international airport also okay just to give you a centermost point perspective of what we're at but once you get past it once you start the second week of december look how much that increases look at these look at these uh, amounts in here there's a lot of there's a big cluster in here of some accumulating snow okay uh, there is some here on the Philadelphia International Airport plot two in this time frame. I think that the second week of December is where I'm highlighting right now for the opportunity for some accumulating snow. Does that mean you can't have something before that? No, it doesn't. But I do think this is uh, going to go up exponentially higher. The chances for you to get accumulating snow as you go into December, maybe that lasts into Christmas. You might have some snow snowing around at Christmas this year. We'll see. Uh, better you better luck this to have that this year than than uh, previous years certainly. Uh, if you look over the past decade here, we really didn't have that many opportunities. We just didn't. So uh, you know if you're a, if you're a winter lover and you don't want to wait until the end of January like we've been doing over most years over the past decade, this is looking a lot better for you this year from that standpoint. What happens in January, February, March remains to be seen. Again, it's outside my comfortable five to six week window. I stop for a reason because I don't want to look like an idiot and sit here and try to forecast for December and say. Oh, yeah, we're going to get a lot of snow in December, and then it ends up being a blowtorch, and you look like a moron, right? Because that's usually what happens. Uh, you can get lucky. Flip a coin, get lucky. But uh, I'm not I'm not in the business to do that, okay? So uh, my Pocket Meteorologist Premium Forum and the Seasonal Text Alerts are available in uh, for purchase now. We did have those all to renew on, uh, for those of you that had them last year, except if you had a payment problem or something, your problem with your payment source. 
Uh, but the rest of you have all renewed on November 1st this year uh, for those text alerts only. Your form's a separate thing. But those all renewed on the on, on uh, February 1st. If you look above me here in the video, epawaweather.com backslash MPM. That is where you can get into uh, the winter text alerts. And, uh, you know, it, it, there's a portion on there just it will take you to the winter alerts page to order those text alerts for our seasonal options and uh, get on those now because uh, we're going to be it's not going to be very long before we get into the snow events uh, same thing with the premium form that's where we geek it out and really talk about the upcoming systems and do an analysis and things like that for any storms coming and for those that are members now can attest to that uh, that everybody really enjoys that uh, kind of level of detail we put into those uh uh, the model analysis ahead of storm. So that's coming. It's going to come sooner. Don't wait to get on this because I know it's going to happen. If your storm's going to come and people are like, what's going on? And we're going to be saying on the Facebook page, sorry, you got to be, you, we're going to hand this, you get on the alerts here to get this information because we're not going to be giving it out. Now we will have the public maps, but if people want information early and we're not going to be able to answer you for that. Um, you know, so premium form is where we're going to have all the discussions for that we have every year for the past nine years. So just to summarize, November is going to be a transition month, okay? It's with alternating warmer, cooler periods. Expecting so snow season to begin in late autumn this year instead of waiting until mid to late January. Uh, and the final point here, and this is one I've been hammering home this entire way of the weekly's video for the first one of the season, is don't trust winter outlooks no matter who the source. Really don't care who it is. I don't care if it's Weather Channel, NOAA, uh, you know, Tom and Timbuk Channel, Timbuk2, whatever. Uh, those, especially ones that are a paintbrush La Nina outlook in a third year La Nina uh, for now. It, just don't even bother with uh, those. I mean, use them for entertainment value. You can read them. I don't care. But uh, just don't just don't put too much faith and stock into them uh, unless they're talking about something that's beyond, Dece uh, you know, uh, up until December. After that, I don't think they'll, you know, ha have that much success unless they're just guessing or guessing right. Okay. So keep that in mind. I went long-winded this week. It's the first week of the Weather Weeklies for the 2022-2023 season. Uh, next next week and subsequent weeks, we're just going to expand on what we already did and just kind of adjust fire and narrow gaps and see where we're going from there. Uh, again, sticking to a five- to six-week lead time for these uh, for these videos. But thank you for joining me again this Sunday. I look forward to seeing you every single Sunday throughout the winter season until the last snow threat of the year. Take care.